your host. And we normally meet at the Willow Glen Library, but for now, um, we are at your living room on Zoom. And I'm so happy to see you all. And I'm very happy to and honored to introduce our featured poet tonight. Denusha Lamaris' first book, The Moons of August, Autumn House 2014, was chosen by Naomi Shihab Nye as the winner of the Autumn House Press Poetry Prize and was a finalist for the Milk Kessler Award. Some of her writing has been published in The Best American Poetry, The New York Times, The American Poetry Review, The Gettysburg Review, Plowshares, and Orion. She's the author of Bonfire Opera, University of Pittsburgh Press Pitt Poetry Series 2020, and the recipient of the 2020 Lucille Clifton Legacy Award. Dunisha teaches poetry independently and was a 2018 to 2020 Poet Laureate of Santa Cruz, California. And you can reach her at www.denishalamaris.com. Please welcome Denisha Lamaris. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. And it's really sweet to get to be here with all of you today. And um, I have such fond memories of reading at the Willow Glen Library. It must have been over a year ago, <laughs> back when the world was- Yeah, at least, at least. <laughs> and I've been wanting to get you on these ever since. Oh, thank you. That was back in the olden days. I'm going to try to change my view so I can uh, look directly. Let me see how I do this. Um, how do I do that? Look at the gallery. Okay, I'll just do this. So I'm looking ahead more. No, I'm trying to have it so I'm not looking sideways. <laughs> That's tricky. I'll figure it out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for being here and for showing up for poetry in these wild times. And I know we've all been through so much this year. And I'm like many of you, I, these kinds of things get me through. Connecting. I just thought somehow I got myself this life raft of poetry um, at the right time in life, early enough in life so that when the storm came, <laughs> I had the raft. And I guess that's true for all of us. We've somehow uh, have this life raft of poetry to um, that, that saves us in a lot of ways, I think. So thank you for, for showing up and I'll read you some poems. That's what we're here to do. And I was, I was looking at the first two poems I want to read, and I noticed that if you put the titles together, they read, The Heart is Not Edible, <laughs> which was just a really funny happenstance. <laughs> but this poem I want to read is The Heart is Not. It's a tiny little poem that I wrote for the New York Times. I wanted to write a poem eight months that you could put in your pocket. So this is a pocket poem for the New York Public Library and I like to sometimes start with it. <laughs> the heart is not, the heart is not a pocket, a thing that can be turned inside out by anybody's hand, not a place for pebbles or loose change, not to carry old receipts, it does not tear at the seam. It doesn't have a seam. It cannot be torn. So that the heart is not. And I thought it would be fun to play with the idea of writing about a pocket if I was going to write them a pocket poem. So <laughs> that seemed to fit. And now edible, since the heart is not edible. And this poem, sometimes I like to give a little backstory because when they're in the book, you don't get the backstory. And um, when I'm reading them, I get to tell you just the silly things of where the poem came from. So this poem came from a dinner with the poet Tony Hoagland and my friend Ellen Bass. Now, Tony was my teacher when I was like 17 years old, but we were having dinner at Ellen's house years ago. He, he died gosh, a couple years ago by now, I believe. But he was very much alive and we were eating crab for dinner. And I said, isn't it strange how almost everything tastes good? Like there's this ugly looking creature at the bottom of the sea and it tastes good. You know, it's just so odd. It depends on how you prepare things, but the world tastes good. And he said, well, that's a funny thought, Danusha. 
And we were talking about another friend of mine who had died. And so all of those things kind of came together in edible. We want it all. Potatoes pulled up from under their poison foliage. The artichoke's heart scraped clean. The tender bodies of crustaceans broken from their calcified shells, saffron stamens plucked from the crocus's center, bark of cinnamon trees, slow sugar tapped from the maple, the golden vomit of bees pried from its waxen vaults. Even for some, the delicate crunch of crickets or hind legs of lamb still tinged with blood. The world is such an unexpected feast. I think of my friend Christopher, who, when he found himself dying early one spring, kept telling us how this was the best part, the letting go. As if in his hunger, he'd somehow broken into death's core, torn off the husk, the brittle shell, found inside the succulent heart and savored it. So, edible. And there's sort of a homage, an homage to my brother there too, because when we were kids, and ate artichokes, he would always save the heart for me because he knew I loved it. He'd say, he'd, he'd say, I give you my heart. Oh my God, there's a whole other poem there probably, um, especially since he is also no longer living. Um, I'm checking my little, I have a little reading list this time. Sometimes I'm organized, sometimes I'm not. I thought I'm gonna be organized today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and read in some kind of order. And uh, this poem is called Monarch. And I wrote it, who's been to Esalen? Some of you, I see a few hands. Okay, Abby was there. <laughs> um, it's just crazy with the butterflies. Everything's crazy. Dolphins leaping, whales swimming by. It's very distracting. And I was lying in a field and there were just monarchs sort of flitting from here to there, butterflies everywhere. If you laid still, they'd land on you. You know, they're just everywhere. And um, we're blessed as we are on the Monterey Bay, right, to have them pass through here. And so this was a poem I wrote that started there with the butterflies on one of my trips there. Monarch, butterfly, papillon, Mariposa. Even the names for these winged beings flutter off the tongue, light, as the papery painted slips of silk that carry them across the continent. They drift down from the trees, dropping from the bare pink arms of eucalyptus, to bob and float above the grass, above yucca plants, lifting their broad spined leaves to the sky above bull thistle, buttercup, sweet fennel, fireweed, milkweed, the bright flowers of brittle bush. How can anything so light exist in the world? A world that made the tiger, the shark, made us. I like to watch up close as one uncurls, its spiral straw sucks nectar from a blossom to see the fine black figure specked with spots, a polka dotted dream grown out of its several bodies, fatted, striped, larval, again and again, trading one form for the next as if it were that easy to be multiple, to slide out of one story into another. Oh, to live like that to let go the past with its burdens, its old hungers, drink the sweetness of the field, then rise filigreed into what must seem endless possible air. 
Oh, butterflies. May we all rise filigreed this year. I feel like this is one of those years where we've had to pass through our, oh, and you're polka dotted like a butterfly right now. I'm looking at Mary Marsha here. <laughs> it's crazy that they actually have black and white polka dots all over their bodies. I once did a side-by-side -side who wore it best with me and a monarch butterfly and I was wearing polka dots because it's just so crazy how they actually look a lot better than, you know, than I could in their perfect polka dots. But that was the truth. All right, what do I want to read next? Mm -hmm, now I'm changing it up. Um, Maybe barefoot. Pushpa was just holding up uh, the American Poetry Review, and I have a few poems in there right now, which is always fun, especially because I'm I get to be in the one where Rita Dove is on the cover, the inimitable Rita Dove. So let's see if I can find one of the ones. Oh, I can. Okay, that's in there, um, called Barefoot. And I was sort of feral as a kid, for a good amount of the summer. Uh, when I was up at my dad's house on the Lost Coast and just roamed around barefoot and kind of a wild thing. And this is about that. Barefoot. I learned the world through the bottoms of my feet, bare in the creeks of summer, stepping on pebbles, the squidge of moss between my toes or on hot, hot asphalt, the hop and skip over cracks, feet already toughened by bramble, dirt, the prickly ground of pine needles, calloused and ready to roam the rough halls of July, of August, of early September, through acres of blackberry sprouts and bristled fountain grass, the spiny clumps of cocklebur and foxtail, through clusters of quartz, agate, feldspar. Small black ants crawled over my toes. Fish nibbled at them in the skinny creek. It wasn't summer until I'd been bitten, ankles pocked with the raised bumps left by mosquitoes, flea bites from Toof Toof the cat, who liked to roam the field, then settle back on the shag rug, where I'd sink my feet in the plush pile before roaming down to the beach, the fine ground sand, cutting myself on loose shards of glass left by broken beer bottles. Sharp-edged shells that dug into the fatted flesh above my instep. As I skimmed for washed-up abalone, oyster shells, sidestepping the glutinous bodies of jellyfish, past crusted bulbs of kelp, their long tubed stems buzzing with flies. Sometimes the body of a dead seal, the peppered fin curling into itself in the heat. Back on the grassy slope, I'd marvel at how I could feel a gopher stirring underground from yards away, that slight rumble in the earth. This was foot knowledge, heel knowledge, knowledge of soul and arch. That domed curve, vaulted nave, everything that entered there, sanctified, holy. So that's a, a new poem from the next book, whatever that next book is going to be. Um, I think several of those were from the new amorphous book. So maybe I'll read from um, my actual current um, book friend here. Okay, I'm just gonna read what I opened to. It's about persimmons <laughs> and among other things. It's called Trouble. Can everyone hear me okay? I think you can, but I just don't know if I'm covering the mic or doing weird stuff. Okay, good. Let me know if I do anything weird and I will fix it. If I can, <laughs> trouble. Um, he'd wanted the persimmons and asked her for them. But when she gave him the brown paper bag brimming over, he was taken aback. Did he really need that many? Still, he brought them home to his wife and soon there were persimmons ripening on the kitchen counters lining the windowsills. 
each day growing more and more succulent until the air was thick and sweet with their scent. At breakfast, he'd break one open with his spoon, the skin supple and ready to give, stir it into his hot cereal. Indescribable, the taste, and a texture he might have described as sea creature meets mana from heaven. When he ate one, he thought of her, and when he saw her, he thought of the persimmons. When her arm brushed just barely against his, did he imagine they both felt the same quickening? In myth, fruit is usually the beginning of disaster. And the way they made themselves so obvious, an almost audible orange against the white walls made him wish he'd never asked for them. Didn't have to smell them sugaring the air with ruin. As he sat there, face lowered to the bowl, spooning the soft pulp into his mouth. So that's the persimmons. And <laughs> I, after I shared that with some students of mine, a woman said, oh, that happened to me once when I gave a man a bag of lemons that he was Italian and he told me <laughs> that it was very flirtatious to him somehow. So I was like, oh, you really have to think before giving a man a bag of fruit. Is that a thing? I don't know. <laughs> it can be a thing. Anyway, it made me laugh. Um, I'll read a few more. Let me look at our time. So to do, to do, do. Okay, I'll read a couple more maybe. Um, I know the one I want to finish with. So let's see how we get there. What else do I want to do? I'm, I'm looking because I think I fall into reading the same things. And every once in a while, I just want to read a poem that I never actually read. And so I try and look through my book and go, oh, is there something here that I don't read? Um, so that's what I'm doing a little bit of. Thanks for bearing with me. I read that. Do I read that? Oh, who knows what? Okay. There's a comment, um, but you're more than welcome to read more than a couple. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet, thank you. We're all not going anywhere. No, I don't want to treat you as a captive audience. Absolutely more than a couple. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Dressing for the burial. Um, a poem about after my brother died and me and his wife, who I know have known since we were little kids. Dressing for the burial. No one wants to talk about the hilarity after death. The way the week my brother shot himself, his wife and I fell on the bed laughing because she couldn't decide what to wear for the big day and asked me, do I go for sexy or Amish? I told her sexy. And we rolled around on the mattress they shared for 18 years, clutching our sides. Meanwhile, he lay in a narrow refrigerated drawer, soft brown curls springing from his scalp, framing his handsome face. This was back when he still had a face and we were going to get to see it. Hold up the black skirt again, I said. She said, which one? And then she said, you look so mafia chic. And I said, thank you. And it went on until we both got tired and our ribs hurt. And now I don't even remember what we wore. Only that we both looked fabulous, weeping over that open hole in the ground. Thank you. Um. This is for um, a little girl I used to know who's not a little girl anymore. That's what happens. <laughs> um, and we were on vacation with her family 
And she did something so odd and startling that I had to write a poem about it years later. And the strange thing was that her mother was the same way as a little girl. Her mother burned down the family house when she was a child, she threw, throwing matches. And they found out because the construction workers were rebuilding it. And here's this little four-year-old or five-year-old. And she came up to them and said, you can build it up, but I can burn it right back down again. <laughs> that is how the family found out that she burned down the house. She was, I mean, she's grown up to be a perfectly stable person. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> and very very smart but that was just what happened anyway this is about her daughter okay these power women these power women hawks for luna it was late afternoon and we were standing on the deck overlooking the gray swath of the pacific when my friend's daughter then four turned to me and pointed at the hawks flying in the distance I can call them if I want, she said, tilting back her head to let out a long, fierce caw, which floated up over the marsh and above the trees. At first, nothing. Then a slash in the distance. And in the next moment, there it was, nearly above us, wings spread wide, the color of rust. And then another. The two floating in silent circles while she sounded her cries. The primal cry of the human, raw and plain. The call to prayer, the weeping at the wall. The singer's highest, most broken note. Whatever it is, we send up into oblivion waiting. Haven't I too called out? Haven't I beseeched something winged to do my bidding? And here she was calling, and here they came in answer, this hinged assembly hovering toward us on the wind. Ten? Twenty? Enough to darken the heavens above where we stood, weighted in place, pinned by a cover of raptors, bone swallowers, Snake eaters, sharp sighted angels of prey, their scaled feet clutching the empty sky. So, true story, true story. <laughs> Child called about, you know, over a dozen hawks. It really might have been as many as 20. Um, just, and I said, Have you ever done this before, Luna? And she said, No. I said, You just knew you could do it? And she said, Yeah, I just knew I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I sent her this poem. She's in her early 20s. And she wrote me back a whole poem about forgetting what it was like to be that girl and trying to remember. So that was a really beautiful experience. And I think so many of the beautiful experiences we have that keep us going are very small things in a way. A girl I used to know when she was a girl, wrote me a poem. I'll never forget that. And during this year of COVID, I've developed a pen pal from a poet I admire. She started sending me little packages and little letters. And it just, you know, gives you something to look forward to. <laughs> you know, a pen pal. These are old school pleasures, my friends. <laughs> you know, this is low tech <laughs> goodness. And really, that's been the those have been some of the sweetest things really have been let me take a sip and i'll read you the last poem and this poem is very much about small things and it's actually called small kindnesses so huh, that's connected i guess to what we're talking about here and i wrote this right before the last inauguration so it's been four years and I remember the mood of that time and how things were starting to feel so, like such a split in the culture. And um, anyway, I wrote this poem, Small Kindnesses. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by. Or how strangers still say, bless you, when someone sneezes a leftover from the bubonic plague. Don't die, we are saying. 
And sometimes when you spill lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. Mostly, we don't want to harm each other. We want to be handed our cup of coffee hot and to say thank you to the person handing it, to smile at them and for them to smile back, for the waitress to call us honey when she sets down the bowl of clam chowder and for the driver in the red pickup truck to let us pass. We have so little of each other now, so far from tribe and fire, only these brief moments of exchange. What if they are the true dwelling of the holy, these fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have my seat. Go ahead. You first. I like your hat. Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate you coming out and doing this on a whatever night it is. I think it's a Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much and thank you lisa for for um inviting me and all of you at san jose poetry center for hosting thank you thank you so much Danusha.